All right, good morning, everyone. I'd like to start, first of all, with a few thank yous, acknowledging the territory that I'm standing on here today. I'm really grateful to be a guest on the land of the Esquimalt and Songhees First Nations. And I want to thank everyone on my team at the Community Social Planning Council. Tom, your picture's the biggest. I thought you'd like that. Um, the one person that's really missing here in my acknowledgments is, is Tracy Collin from the Horner Foundation. And this slide would have been a lot more beautiful if I had her picture on it too. So if you're watching, Tracy, I'm thinking of you, and you are on this slide. And uh, thanks to the timekeepers as well. I'm going to be switching gears a bit in our conversations this morning that we've had about school health. I'm going to be talking specifically about after school programs. So from my practicum at the Social Planning Council, the major deliverable that I was able to give to them was an evaluation of their Youth Program Quality Initiative. And that is one of many different initiatives. It's a small team I showed you on the last slide, but they are involved in a lot of really neat work in the greater Victoria area. And I was able to dabble uh, to some small extents and some larger extents in a variety of these. But the Youth Program Quality Initiative is the one where I spent most of my time, and I'll just be calling it the YPQI, just to keep it short. And it has a really interesting history because it comes out of the United States and out of this larger discourse of how do we apply ideas of quality improvement into the nonprofit or social services sector. So the idea of quality when you're working with human beings can be a little bit problematic. Uh, people don't like being labeled as successes or failures. And this particular graphic is criticizing some of the philosophies around the No Child Left Behind Act in the United States. And you may have heard on the news um, or in reports that it's very test driven in the educational system in the states in the No Child Left Behind Act. And this is the Secretary of Education here labeling the kids in the graphic. And in all of that criticism, <laughs> um, in all of that criticism, there has actually been a lot of funding that have gone to some more innovative approaches, looking specifically at after school time. And the Youth Program Quality Initiative is probably the biggest initiative in the United States that looks at improving spaces that are instructional settings that are outside of school. And it creates some really enticing possibilities because there tends to be a little more flexibility than within the school system to adapt to the needs of youth. And that, that's the little Horner Foundation symbol there. So the quality improvement process of the YPQI methodology has, of course, an assessment stage. So you may be wondering, what, how are they defining quality in this context? And Weikart, who developed this YPQI methodology, they frame it in a pyramid. So this is like the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And you have safe environment on the bottom, supportive environment, and this is being welcoming and inclusive. These qualities of interaction, which include in collaboration, good youth adult partnerships, and they put at the top of the pyramid, the self-actualization, uh, if you would, is youth engagement. So do youth have the choice to actually do their own planning of the programs? Do they get a chance to reflect meaningfully? And uh, do they get a chance to exercise leadership and choice? And in the methodology, the observations are actually done by peer workers. So youth workers will observe each other's programs, write as many notes as they can, and then afterwards get together as a team with all those notes and say, how did we score? Based. So it's really neat because it's a really team building activity, very different from a typical kind of industrialized approach to quality. Because the team gets together and says, how are we doing? What have we observed ob objectively? And then they make a plan for improving on those different items uh, that are going to make the program be better, a better program for youth. And this is a diagram that comes out of Washington State, which probably has the highest fidelity of the YPQI model. And interestingly, it's really framed in the states. The outcomes are really framed in terms of educational success. So how does being involved in high quality after school programs lead to better grades, uh, less dropping out, things like that. And although that's really important in the states, uh, here in BC, looking at implementing the YPQI, or we are implementing YPQI in Victoria here in a Canadian context for the first time, the story and the rhetoric doesn't really match up. 
And looking at the numbers, can you flip that again? What number did you just show me, buddy? Okay. Looking at the YPQI scores of the programs that have been involved here in Victoria, and we've had about 21 agencies involved so far, the programs here are actually really high quality already. So if you look at the YPQI before and after studies that have done in the States, most of the programs here are actually doing better than the after programs in the American studies. So that's, that's something really neat and a strength uh, that we found. But talking again about like what's our story here in Victoria and what can the YPQI do for us here? Mental health is the big thing that we've been hearing about all morning. And I'm going to bump up your numbers, Maria, with the uh, Adolescent Health Survey that comes from the McCreary Center. They say it's, it's one in five kids who get diagnosed with a mental health condition. And actually, for girls, it's one in four. So it's ridiculously high. And in terms of bullying and teasing, we're looking at one in three students that say that they've been made uncomfortable or socially excluded. And the intriguing thing with YPQI, uh, again coming from the McCreary data, is we see that after school involvement really uh, gives a chance to have a positive impact in a way that could be really tangible. So one of the outcomes of my evaluation in terms of the de different recommendations that I've made is to dig a little more into mental health and how we can frame the YPQI as having a potential social return on investment in terms of mental health improvements. And the McCreary data here shows that youth who are involved in extracurricular activities, when they feel that their voice is valued, they're way more likely to rate their health as high. So this is a really big difference here, although this bar looks pretty light. You can see it's 96%. And over here, youth who felt that they were bullied are way more likely to rate their mental health as good if they find that their extracurricular activities are meaningful. So these aspects of having a valued voice, of being involved in meaningful activity, they're all qualities that were on that pyramid that I showed you in the very beginning. So making sure that youth have choice, making sure their voice is valued, that they have reflection, that the space is safe and inclusive. These are the kinds of things that the YPQI gives workers the tools to be able to look at how are we doing in, in our program in terms of building leadership and skills building. The other area I recommend we look at a little more in depth is, uh, is the employability. So do youth, when they have more leadership skills and are able to direct their own activities and extracurricular programs, how does that translate to them being more likely to find jobs? And we have, in the greater Victoria area, 4,000 youth who are not in school and not working right now. So there's a huge need for a boost in employability. And speaking of jobs, the YPQI so far has been targeting the participants have all been youth workers. And we have to acknowledge the logistics of youth work is a really hard field to be in. You're looking at, although it's very large, you're looking at really below average pay for youth workers. And so most youth workers are going to be working under the living wage, very long hours, or they're going to have lots of part-time jobs and not very many hours to complete their work. So lots of the recommendations that I made were to emphasize organizational support as well as the personal support for, being, for participating in the YPQI so that we can raise the bar not just for youth workers, but also the organizations that are participating, the entire nonprofit sector, and the youth themselves to be leaders in their own communities. And that's it. <laughs> All right, another stimulating Presentation. Thank you, Sam. Questions? Great. Thank you. Great presentation. Um, so, in terms of the YPQI, is it a is it a test score that the programs go through? Like they get a certain score, and is this um, how? How far and wide is this used, and is it recognized? So, okay, I see that this program over here has this YPQI score of blah, blah, blah. I know that they're doing this, and da, da, da. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in the states, it's really widely implemented. It's in about 30 of, 30 of the 50 states, and in half of those, it's instituted at a statewide level. In Victoria, it's uh, very experimental, and so it's, it's gaining momentum. We're like in the third year now of implementing it, so it's starting to build, and that the awareness is starting to build. 
but it's but unless you know about the YPQI, and most of you in this room don't, you wouldn't necessarily know without being walked through what these numbers mean. Does that answer your question? Other questions? Oh, oh a couple of them. Darn, I thought I was going to get to ask my question. Thank you. Um, it's more of getting your opinion than a question. Um, so given the importance of these after-school programs, so the, the non-school aspect of youth life that is somewhat programmed um, for mental health uh, and, and other benefits, how, so one of the, so I, I work for the Social Planning Council and this is one of the programs that I coordinate and one of the challenges that we have is how do you actually support a system, basically this is, it's an umbrella support for youth programs right across the board. Um, and there's other things in play in the Greater Victoria area as well that are trying to do that to support, provide these umbrella supports. Um, and it's all hit and miss in terms of how these things get funded. And I'm curious to get your view on how do you build a, a much stronger, more sustainable set of uh, support services to these youth programs? Mm-hmm, yeah. And uh, the keynote this morning, you would really would have loved because she talked a lot about how we've moved from like a welfare state to an increasingly neoliberal climate where we're relying more and more on private philanthropy, which the YPQI is funded entirely from one private philanthropic organization right now. And I think the two methods really are to keep it lean and lower that demand on the youth worker's time so that the organizations are not having to put in quite as much time into being involved in the YPQI. Because it, it takes about, um, when I crunch the numbers, about 45 hours per staff member. And that when a staff member maybe only works six hours a week normally, it's really hard to pull that kind of time. So one of the things that I recommend is to really change the way that the YPQI is administered so that you have one year right at the beginning where staff are really involved and put in a lot of time and there can be a one year grant that they can get to get sort of a more intensive training and then in subsequent years have uh, much more limited evaluation activities that aren't going to be as time intensive as the full fidelity YPQI model. So a lot of that is being really lean and being really selective about where the investment goes in. Does that answer your question somewhat? Kathy. Thank you. It sounds like you have a lot of demands for the services. Am I right? Like demands for the services that this particular organization offers? Well, there's certainly a high demand for the youth services. Is that what you mean? Services I think so, for youth? yeah. And, and again, my question is perhaps naive because I'm not sure I'm understanding exactly what's, what's happening out there. You don't have to answer that. But my question is related to it in the sense that um, I'm wondering with the focus on mental health right now in actually across BC in the school system, I think it's beyond BC, um, do you market the services at all? you might or might not have the capacity to actually uh, respond to demand and service. Can you just comment on that? Mm -hmm. So part of the recommendations that I've made for this program is to move away from the, the, just the focus on quality, which is really strong in the United States, and to look here at what's important here and what's important to funders here and what's, what's on everyone's mind here. And by drawing the link between after-school programs and mental health, uh, that can really strengthen the possibilities for funding and also the interest and, and the image and the marketing, as you say. Uh, so the YPQI here in Victoria hasn't had like a very sophisticated marketing strategy, but more word of mouth. And right from the get-go, um, the Social Planning Council, when they were introducing this initiative, got folks together and said, is this of interest? And did a bit of a needs assessment and said, are, are, are we interested in having these extra supports for youth workers in terms of building up their professional development and offering this quality assessment process? And there was an interest there. 
but it's really hard to maintain when, as, as you know, like that evaluation when you're adding it on top of things that you already do in a climate where you're already having to fill out a lot of evaluations for different funders, that it has to be better integrated into the system and there has to be like more finite investments at once. Thank you, Sam. Thank you so much.